Good morning, family. Good morning. And again, happy Mother's Day, Pastor Karen and I uh, as well. And thank you for making this your first stop on Mother's Day. The COVID changed the relationship between believers and houses of worship. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's, there's a healing process and a regathering process taking place because we were estranged from each other um, when the houses of worship were closed as a result of COVID. But thank you for making your way back and understanding the importance of community. And those of you who are joining us from across the country uh, and other countries such as Asia, and Africa, UK, Latin America, South America, we are glad to have you joining us and being part of this spiritual family. Yes. Amen? Amen. Mother's Day. Wow. Yeah, it, 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 it's the second <laughs> largest gathering for church outside of Easter. Really? Mother's Day? Yes. What happened to Father's Day? <laughs> we'll talk about Father's Day when we get to Father's. Okay. <laughs> but, but I noticed that whenever guys get in trouble, even if it's on national television, they call for their mom. Yeah. What is that? Because mama bear don't play. <laughs> mama bear them poise come out, she ready to slap somebody. I've seen it. My mother came through sometimes ready to, she said, <laughs> I remember when Fonzie got in trouble in school and the teacher <laughs> was talking about, we went to a Lutheran school, you know, and it was a time where it was shifting over from uh, the, the school uh, providing certain um, uh, 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 authority uh, response systems and structures that they had back in the days. <laughs> and my mother came up to the school and he, she said, you don't touch my son. She said, I, ooh, you ever touched my... And she was about to... And Daddy had to grab her up. She was, it was pa a parent-teacher night. Babe, if you're watching... <laughs> That's because Mommy was about that life. Don't touch her kids. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> all right, so that explains it all. That's why they call on Mom first. I, I get it. And Dad is there to restrain Mom. Okay. <laughs> I have to get how it works. We had an incredible week this week. How many of you were with us on Wednesday night with Bishop T.D. Jakes? Um, it was a wonderful evening, uh, special event, really, to have two individuals of our stature come together and have a conversation, uh, demonstrating respect, admiration for each other, modeling that, especially as men of color, uh, accomplishment of color in various fields. And I think it was really, really a, a great uh, opportunity to, to showcase that kind of respect and admiration in our community. I had fun. I, I wanted to dig in a little bit, and, um, but time didn't allow it, but, but it, was, it was a great opportunity. How many of you enjoyed the conversation? I enjoyed it. Jake and I. One of the things I, I think um, it, ex it, it, it expressed, one of the many things that it expressed was the fact that even though you might have, you know, Theological differences, uh, any, and also uh, certain um, ways of preaching and stuff like that. But for two men of color to be able to come down, sit down, and have conversations that will better the group instead of worrying about this, you know, the individual meant a lot, especially for men of color observing that. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen to that. You can applaud to that. That's okay. You can applaud to that. Um, you know, he had reached out. He, he had a um, conversation with Charlemagne at City College uh, the night before. Uh, and of course, this is a different context. What I, what I appreciated, during the conversation, he said, you know, you're allowing me to think out of both sides of my brain. And often, if we're in a religious context, it's strictly religious. If we're in a business context, it's strictly bu business. But to be able to bring the two together and have a free and open conversation uh, from both perspectives, with, at the intersection of faith and culture, I think we both in, enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, they want to take it to Dallas now, uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll discuss the honorarium first, and <laughs> I'll decide what we do on that one.
But, but it was great. It was a great occasion, uh, and it was great interaction and, and fellowship as well. So thank you all who came out to support us. Those of you who watch us online, uh, it's online if you missed it. Uh, if you want to see it, we're up to like 28,000 views. We've left it there and let it continue to be uh, watched and enjoyed. What else? I think, I think that's I it. Think that's you and I were talking about series. Yes. And the, 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 the culture has changed, and we are seeing it in church. Uh, I had Before we go there, uh, I just want to throw a fun fact out. All right. And encourage individuals to call their mothers for Mother's Day. Don't text, call your mother for Mother's Day. And the fun fact? And the fun fact is, <laughs> more phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. To the point where these, this, uh, these holiday chats with mothers often cause traffic for the phone carriers and it spikes by much as 37%. All on Mother's Day? All on Mother's Day. What about Father's Day? <laughs> we'll get to Father's Day next month. Like <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you and I were talking about series. Mm -hmm. And it came up because you reminded me that I have to finish the series on Occupy. Yes, Occupy. Yeah. Is, do, are you all still interested in <laughs> Occupy? You want to finish that out? But I, uh, Pastor Jamal was telling me, you know, people, I've been talking to people, feedback, and they, they want you to get to the rest of Occupy. So I said, okay, we're going to make that happen. But it raised a, a, a pattern, a reality. Um, I had dinner this past week with uh, Pastor Eric Mason, pastor of Epiphany Church in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they have uh, a church here as, uh, as well. And, you know, you mutual uh, friendship uh, with, with Pastor Mason. And we were talking about, you know, teaching series and how that plays out and how people enjoy teaching series. And that's when it came to my mind about the influence of series and why series have become so important. And you made the comment that this is a series generation. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, we need to unpack that. How many of you watch series on television? Live streaming series. It, see, it used well, to no, be just a movie. Or s service providers. That's what I said. You said television. I said television? Yeah, because like, like, unless you have a certain level of um, TV provider, you, you, you go on service provider because I can rewind, pause, Binge, you know, I got to wait till the next show uh, to come out next week. How many have TV uh, services? Fios, cable. See, look how many, look, look. not too many. How many have, All right. uh, uh, how many of, of you have Wi Fi? All right, so you're watching them on your devices. <laughs> Let me speak the language of the culture. Uh, okay. But everything is broken up in series now. Whether it's Netflix or any other provider, everything is broken up in series. And you can binge watch, and that's how content is being consumed. And it's like, so I was curious to know why. Um, what did you find? I found a couple of articles, especially when I looked at Disney. And yes, I'm going to say Disney. I know you know, we're praying for them. But Disney even went from putting a couple of their series, it was supposed to be a movie, like Loki was supposed to be a movie, and they turned it into a series, and they started realizing some of the trends that were happening. And one of the things they said is, humans are attracted to things in series because it allows us to immerse ourselves in a narrative or storyline and become emotionally invested in the characters and plot. So you become connected with the characters mm -hmm. in the series, you want to know what's going to happen uh, the next episode. Mm -hmm. And does it become something that you talk about with others who are also watching the same series? Do you say, did you see that series or did you see what so-and-so did in that series? Is that what happened? I just want to get the feedback. Is that is that's how it's working? So it's creating community. I, the world is changing so fast in ways that we can't imagine. So... 
And, and a lot of this conversation, because they're trying to say, okay, how did this, what does this conversation have to do with church, right? Because a lot of churches have seen the trend and they started implementing series to the point where you see the conversations happening behind the services and even within people's small groups, they go to church and they look forward to the next Sunday because it's in a series form. And that's been the, the culture, especially in the younger generation coming up. That's interesting because my learning style is abstract, concrete, random rather, concrete, random. Um, so I, I, I want and love structure, but at the same time, I don't want boundaries. I want to be able to expand my creativity. And in my generation, church was about structure and yet being open to the move of the Holy Spirit. But this generation seems to want more of structure that pours open and creative content into the structure. Am I saying that? Yeah, but I, I think they, they still love the flow of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think in, uh, because of the, the experience that they have, and, and remember, it's because they're so, such an experience-based community, especially younger generation, they're looking for a similar experience next Sunday. So the series helps provide that other experience. So if the Holy Spirit shows up today, right, and, and within that series, and while it's powerful, the content was powerful, the move of the Spirit was powerful, the worship is powerful. Man, what's going to happen next week when he does finishes up the next series, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, so there's an, a, a hunger. There's one of the, the gorgeous things that has happened after COVID is that the people who are in church want to be here. Mm -hmm. Those who are coming want to be yes. here. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that means I have to finish this series. Yes, yes, you have to finish this series on Occupy, especially because you, 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 had, you try to bring it a little into the conversation on Wednesday with, with Bishop Jakes, and he alluded to it a little bit, but um, it, it, didn't, it didn't unwrap the way, you know, it, it, you're going to unwrap it during the service. All right. So people want to know how do I navigate the intersection of faith and culture? What are the boundaries? Are there boundaries? What are those boundaries? What should I expect of myself? What should I understand about God in the intersection of faith and culture? All of that. Okay, um, let's do it. I mean, it's Mother's Day, but can I do that? Can I, can I go there? I'm going to go sit down and observe you. You're going to observe doing me? Doing your thing. Okay, all right. <laughs> let's, let's do it. So the big word, the big word is occupy. And the text is found in Luke chapter 19. And it is followed by Jesus having an interaction first with a blind man outside of the city of Jericho and then with a very wealthy tax collector who was a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus inside the city. If you know, remember the story of Zacchaeus, um, he was the man who was short in stature, climbed up into the tree, sees Jesus passing by screams out to him, and Jesus says, this day salvation has come to your home. And he said, I must come and visit your home. Which, you know, I, look, it turned things upside down. And how many know Jesus did a lot of turning things upside down? So for him to go to the home of a tax collector, almost affirm the tax collector uh, to those who were watching from outside critically. But what was really going on, Jesus was creating transformation in the heart of an individual that would ultimately end or impact the city in which he lived. And he would engage in a redistribution, a radical redistribution of wealth. So the gospel is about personal transformation and social reform. You need to write that down. If, you're gonna, if you want me to go in, you be ready to go in with me, right? Yes. Taking notes? Yes. Okay. Um, so the gospel of Jesus Christ is twofold. It's about personal transformation, transforming the individual, and thereby reforming the culture, changing and reforming and influencing the culture. So the gospel is about two things, personal transformation and social reform. Personal transformation and social reform. 
Why? Because in society, systems and structures, practices, traditions are passed from one generation to another. If those systems and structures perpetuate evil, perpetuate things that um, are antagonistic to the kingdom of God and the way God designed life to function, then those systems and structures need to be changed. How do you change them? You begin by changing the individual, right? So you change the person. So what did Jesus do? He encountered the chief tax collector of Jericho, so impacted that man's life and heart and mind, radical transformation took place. And what was the result of that? Zacchaeus says what? If I've stolen from any, I'm going to return it to them. And I'm going to take a major portion of my goods and distribute it to the poor. So just by impacting one individual, he impacted the entire city. It's economics. It's, 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 it's sense of moral responsibility. All of that was impacted. And why was that important? Because where does he start? He starts in the outskirts of Jericho with a beggar, right? And he works his way from the beggar, those who are marginalized, disenfranchised, the least within the society, right? And heals him but knows that it's not enough to just heal that individual. He's got to go into the systems and structures and impact those systems and structures to change what perpetuates the kind of poverty that the blind man was experiencing. Are you all with me this morning? Amen. Amen. So Jesus was strategic. We have reduced Christianity to a religion and getting to heaven. When I got saved, all right, I came out of a radical organization called the Nation of Islam, and very active in those days back in the 60s. So when I came to Jesus in, 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 in the 70s, I didn't lose that. Uh, God sanctified it. He doesn't take away your personality, and we're going to talk about that because it relates to occupy and the word occupy. He sanctifies who you are as an individual so that he can use you as an instrument of righteousness towards the building of the kingdom and influencing the culture with the spirit of the kingdom. But when I got saved, I went into a church and a context that whose, uh, whose eschatology was Jesus was coming. In fact, it looked like he was going to be here in two weeks. That was in 1975. This is 2023, 2023, right? And he hasn't come yet. So somewhere along the line, I realized he may take some time. So the question is, what do I do in the meantime? How do I live? How do I think? Because if you are thinking that he's going to return any moment within two weeks, then why explore the possibilities that can come out of your gift, talents, and abilities? Why think about making change within society? Why have visions and dreams? Why have all of that? What, you should, we, what we should do is just sit and wait and let them show up, right? So how you see and understand these things are critical because it'll determine the actions you take or don't take. The parables which Luke 19 is a parable about the talents, are designed to build a bridge between what we know and what we don't know, between our reality and the reality of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not just heaven, a place that we go to after we die. No, it is a way of thinking, doing, and being. It's a comprehensive way of seeing life, that informs our words, thoughts, motives, actions, and our attitudes. This is why Jesus say, pray, thy kingdom come. Why? So that thy will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom is an expression of the will of God. And the will of God is always toward human flourishing and the repair of a broken humanity. So Jesus was not teaching us to pray for his future return. He was teaching us to pray that the kingdom of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God, all that he came to release is actively engaged in human society and the human experience. That's why he was casting out demons in one time, at one point in Luke 11. And he says, if I, with the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom has come. 
If he feeds 5,000 people miraculously, the kingdom has come. Are you with me? If he challenges the political power structure, which he did, the religious power structure, which he did, the kingdom has come. So the kingdom comes whenever the manifestations of justice and righteousness and peace that God wants to bring to human society appears and manifests itself, the kingdom has come. So when we think about the words occupy, let's unpack that, all right? Let's go to the text, and it's found in Luke chapter 19. And I think it's important for us to read the beginning of the text. So we go to verse 1. Ah, actually, let's go to verse 11. Verse 11. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, Amplified Version. While they were listening to these things, remember, it was a conversation, if you back up, uh, Jesus was talking about Zacchaeus and this whole encounter because the disciples were concerned. They said, well, you know, what are you doing messing with this tax collector? And Jesus said that he is a child of Abraham also and must be considered. So let's go to verse 9. Chapter 19, verse 9. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he too is a spiritual son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Why did he tell this parable? Not on my face, it's, on, it's in your text. Read the rest. Why did he, why did he tell this parable? Huh? Why did he tell this parable? Because he was near Jerusalem. And this journey to Jerusalem began on his way to Jericho. All right? So he's near Jerusalem. And he tells him a parable because he's near Jerusalem. Why else? Huh? They assumed what? That the kingdom of God was going to appear, come on, immediately as soon as he reached the city. And that's why on Palm Sunday we celebrate with the palms because that was the day of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and everybody thought this is it. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. He's going to use supernatural power. He's going to restore the nation of Israel and he's going to bring peace and justice to the earth. All of that was going to take place and that's why they put the palms down saying Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They didn't know that this was only part of it. He had to go to the cross. He had to die. He had to Get up from the dead. All of that was part of the plan, but they didn't see that. They didn't understand that. So they thought the kingdom would be immediately established in its physical outward form. But here in this parable, Jesus indicates, no, salvation has come now, but the consummation of the kingdom is yet into the future. So there's going to be an interval between his first coming, which was 2,000 years ago, and his second coming, which could be tomorrow. But we don't live in that way. We live in the way of occupying. And we want to understand, well, what does that mean? So, and they assume that the kingdom of God was coming, was going to appear immediately as soon as the, 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 uh, he reached the city. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to obtain for himself a kingdom and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants, gave them 10 minas, one apiece, each equal to about what? A hundred days wages. This is a lot of money, folks. A lot of money for that time. Remember, there was no middle class. It was only the rich and powerful elite and the artisans and farmers and those who were poor and working class. A hundred days wages, a lot of money. And said to them, what? What did he say to them? Do business with this until I return. Okay. Do business. What does occupy mean? This is the King James language. But here we find 
do business. Also, busy oneself. Busy oneself. Another way of saying it, be pragmatic. Be practical. Be practical. In other words, don't be so heaven bound you're no earthly good. I'm going to try that one more time. In other words, don't be so heaven bound you're no earthly good. You have value here on this planet. That's why he left us here. He said, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but in the world, protect them from evil and the evil one. So his prayer for us was a prayer of protection while we do business. Why? Because there will be forces against us doing business. That's real. So if I'm going to Define this, give you a working definition for occupy. Are you ready? Make, uh, in fact, let me, let me rephrase that. Make maximum use. of the gifts and opportunities God gives you. I need to unpack this. What's our definition of occupy? I was a little choppy. <laughs> Give it to me in English. What is our working definition of occupy? Which means that he's going, he's given you gifts and he's going to give you opportunities for those gifts. I'm going to try that one more time. He's given you gifts and he's going to give you opportunities for the use of those gifts. Look, however you think, the quality of your thinking determines the quality of your life. So don't complain about your life if you don't want to change the way you think. Because everything that you've gotten so far is based upon how you think. And the scripture says you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So more money is not the answer. It's a problem if you don't have your mind renewed and transformed to deal with that. So, what does Occupy mean, CCC? And what does Maximum mean? Maximum. In modern day language, and I don't want to put the Greek word here, but it's really where we get the word being pragmatic or be practical. In modern day language, the word Occupy means capacity. Aptitude. In a broader sense, occupy refers to all the various gifts that God has given you. Your natural gifts, Spiritual gifts. How many know about spiritual gifts? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12. You read any about the leadership gifts in Ephesians chapter 4? And material. So gifts are what? That which you're born with, right? They are what? That which 
is those charismas, that's what it's called, that the Holy Spirit gives us. It's endowment and empowerment by the Holy Spirit that you could not have on your own naturally. And, and there is what? Also the material gifts, the things that you have in substance. And how many know that everything we have comes from God? That's another foundation. Everything we have comes from God. I enjoy the life that I have because it came, it was a gift from God. Turn to your neighbor, say neighbor. Everything you have is a gift from God. So our capacity also includes, come on, let's make a list, all right? It includes your personality. And, and this is beautiful because when you get saved, you don't lose your personality. Just because you may have misused it doesn't mean you lose it. Tell your neighbors, he's talking about somebody you know. It's all over your face. Yeah, because you could have a great personality, but if you don't know how to use that personality in a way that's going to be positive and a blessing, all right, you can be annoying. How many know, don't point, how many know some people with annoying personalities? Some folks are just too bubbly. God doesn't say, leave that, drop that, you're saved now. No. He says, give it to me. Give me who you are. And I'll begin to temper it, tame it, and teach it. So that you can now apply it. So that it can heal and bless, encourage, and empower. So when we think about Occupy, we're thinking about the totality of our being, including our what? I can't hear you, including our what? Personality. Our personality. Our openness. And if I, if, if, if I were to give you a word for this, your humility. Because when you're humble, you're open. Pride and arrogant people are not open. They think they know it all. They don't want to hear what anybody else has to say. But when you walk in humility, you remain open. You keep an open mind. There's an openness to ideas and possibilities. That's important that you bring that to the table. And guess what? You can, be, you can occupy to the degree that you're open. To the degree that you exhibit humility. The scripture is clear that if we humble ourselves, we'll be what? Exalted. The scripture says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the hump. Somebody's in the book. To the who? To the humble. Amen? Occupy means bringing our creativity. Our creativity is part of our capacity. And we, we, we all have degrees of creativity, differences of creativity in terms of where our creativity flourishes best. But we bring our creativity. Occupy means tapping into your personality, your openness, your creativity, your inventiveness. Occupy means to be who you are in personality under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Occupy means being open to ideas, to possibilities. Because if occupy means opportunities, then you have to be tuned in and prepared for those opportunities. It was Henry Ford who said often opportunities are missed because they show up in overalls, looking like work. <laughs> Your inventiveness. Here's something else. 
your risk tolerance. Your risk tolerance. You say, well, how does all this tie into a parable, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Do you want me to unpack it? The guy with one, and and let me just say this about um, the parable in Luke 19. You really can't appreciate it fully without comparing it to the parable in Matthew 25. How many remember the parable in Matthew 25? It's the parable of the talents, and I've been using, interchanging the language here. Because in Matthew 25, you read about him giving to one man five, to another man two, right? To another man one. And what the guy did with one was a demonstration of his risk tolerance. He was afraid. You cannot occupy if you walk in fear. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but why did God give one man five, one man two, and another man one? He gave them according to their several ability, and the word ability there simply means capacity. According to their capacity. And here's the beautiful thing. You can increase your capacity. How do we know that? Look at the parable. The one with five. How many remember the parable in Matthew 25? The one with five, double it to what? Ten. The one with two, double it, right? To four. But the one with one, what did he do? He buried it. Because he was afraid that if he invested it, he would lose it. You can't occupy if you're afraid of investing. Because investment is part of occupying. And you invest according to your risk tolerance. And that's why if you're going to invest in the stock market, what do they do? They ask you, what's your risk tolerance? That'll determine how that money is broken up into investment. If you're going to invest in something that's more sure, more more guaranteed, or you're going to invest in something that's going to have a higher risk, guess what? The higher the risk, the higher the return. See, we've made this stuff so religious, we don't see the practicality with which Jesus was communicating to us. We've got to bring our inventiveness. Our relationships are part of our capacity. And that's why people who are successful have a very large relationship network. Because they understand that relationship is the network for life. Well, Pastor, I just don't like people. (laughs) Okay, then stay pulled. (laughs) Broken, disgusted. Because guess what? Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall who give? It's a network of exchange, sowing, and reaping. So part of your capacity is your what? Hey guys, I pastor a church. I pastor people beyond the church. I'm an introvert who loves people. You go figure that out. It may sound like an oxymoron, a contradiction, but it isn't. I like being by myself. I can go to a diner, sit down and eat by myself. Anybody else out there like that? Some people need somebody else to go have a meal. I don't. I don't. I'm good. The whole family could say, we'll be back. (laughs) I'm ready. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I can accomplish with some gift like that. Don't let that go by you. Their leaving was a gift. (laughs) 
Our relationships are part of our capacity to occupy. So you have to get better at relationship building. One of the things that Bishop Jakes and I talked about is how we will walk away from a good deal because we don't like the tie that the person on the other side of the table was wearing. So what? You don't like the tie. What does the tie have to do with the deal? Turn your neighbor and say, he's definitely talking about somebody you know. <laughs> and we'll walk away because of some emotional involvement. It's different if the person on the other side crosses some moral boundaries that you have established in a moral framework. That's different. But you don't like their tie? We, get, we, we, we major on minors and lose the opportunity. Don't you know that every opportunity that God brings to you will have some baggage that you have to deal with? Because we're all broken and wounded individuals. So you have to discern. That's why every decision we make is a value judgment. You have to judge the value of the relationship, the value or impact it may have upon you personally. And let me tell you something, and, and, and the bishop and I talk about this, we never sit down to a deal we can't walk away from. Because if you can't walk away, you don't have the deal, the deal has you. All right, 10 people got that, thank you. Our relationships, your intellect. That's why you should always be growing, learning. You never stop learning. Don't ever stop learning. You learn, you grow, you expose yourself to new information. You broaden your knowledge base. Talk to other people. You've heard me say this again and again over the years. If you're the smartest one in your group, what do you need? A new group. You want people in your life who will stretch you intellectually. Who make you think about things you weren't thinking about. And I refer back to the conversation because it just bears repeating. Bishop looked at me during the course of the conversation. He said, you know, you're making me think out of both sides of my brain. That's exactly what I want to do. And you want people to stretch your creativity. Again, let's get it out of the religious mindset. Jesus is facing 5,000 people who are hungry because they've been listening to his message and he has compassion and said, we need to feed them. He turns to his disciples and what does he say? What do we have? Because we don't want to send these people away, but they're hungry. What do we have? And he turns to one of his disciples and he says, well, feed them. That was a challenge. He knew what he was going to do, the scripture says. He had the power to multiply, but he turned to his staff. <laughs> and gave them an opportunity to think creatively. And if I was there, I would have said, um, I'd have started thinking about all the other miracles I saw him do. I'd ask him, how do I pray? What do I do? Just give me the word. Direct me here. But they said, well, we have a little boy's lunch. What is that to feed so many? And we can't go out and buy food for all these people. They missed an opportunity because they weren't thinking at the level that they need to be thinking at. And as you live life on levels and arrive in stage and experience it in season, your level of thinking has to change and progress. That's why arrogance will keep you in a prison that loses opportunities. Because you only have access to the knowledge in your own mind. And you want to access knowledge outside of your own mind and expand your knowledge base. Can I get an amen from somebody? And, 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 and the list goes on and on and on in terms of what you bring to the table for God to anoint so that you can occupy. What does occupy mean, CCC? Come on. <laughs> what?
What does occupy mean, CCC? One more time, CCC. What does occupy mean? The reason he was so hard, the master was so hard on the man with one talent and talk. Did you read it? He said, let him be banned and thrown into outer darkness. That was harsh. Why? Because with the opportunity to use our gift, talents, and abilities that are God-given comes responsibility to employ them, to make them work. The man's excuse, I was afraid, so I buried it to make sure you got back what you gave me. He said, no, you lacked initiative. You're lazy. The demand for productivity takes us back to Genesis. And let me close with this, because next week I'm going to unpack this more. This takes us back to Genesis. What was God's original word to humanity? Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Dominion, not domination. Have dominion. Got it? Things went wrong. Jesus comes back. He said, I'm come that you may have what? Life. And that you may have it how? More abundantly. So Jesus comes. First, we don't have the time, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus comes as the last Adam. He comes as Adam. Why is that important? I'm glad you asked. Because the first Adam gave birth to one humanity that was of the flesh. The second and last Adam gives birth to a new humanity, which is of the Spirit. Because if any man be in Christ, they are a, come on, talk to me, a new creation. He is the firstborn of a new creation. So Jesus, as the second and last Adam, now brings about a new humanity. And what's his word to that new humanity? Born again, born of the Spirit. Be fruitful, multiply, multiply. Bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Listen to these words as he sent his disciples out. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize, right? Make disciples. And here's the beautiful part. And the Lord worked with them with signs following. He doesn't send you out on your own. He goes with you. He goes with you. Bring me your gifts, your talents, even your risk tolerance. I'll elevate it so that you can tolerate more risk. Bring me all of you. And I'm going to show you how to occupy, how to influence, how to increase. What was his word to the nation of Israel? I'll make you the and not the <coughs> excuse me, I'll place you and not that's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. We bring the totality of our being to him. And is he going to judge us based upon what we accomplish? Absolutely. But you shouldn't have to worry about judgment if you're being faithful with all that he's given you. Pastor Bernard, where do we start with this? I'm glad you asked. Here's a man that's about to leave, lead over a million people out of a society physically, the entire workforce. He's going to lead them out of Egypt. And he asked the same question. Where do I start? And God's answer was, what's in your hand? What do you got? What do you got? Give me what you've got. Never mind what you don't have and need. Let's work. Let's begin with what you have accomplished. What you have discovered. What you have achieved. Bring it to me. And I'll do things with it you never imagined you could do with that intellect. That openness, that personality of yours, that inventiveness of yours, that creativity of yours. 
you can't imagine because I can't see what I can do with it. Amen. I'm glad someone said so before I said it. So as we unpack Occupy, we're going to look at the talents differently, the, the parables differently. Because when we look at these parables, we're looking at investment, capital, risk tolerance. We're looking at all of these elements that we have to deal with in real life, in real time, here and now. God is glorified when we bear fruit. And not just bear fruit, but that our fruit remains. He wants us to produce, and he wants us to produce with sustainability. Are you with me? I'm going to close with this. How many ever read the miracle of the oil with Elijah the prophet and the widow woman? The oil didn't stop. She ran out of pots. You need to keep your capacity up with what God is doing in your life. Her capacity ended. Not the blessing. Not the oil. Not the miracle. Not the power. Her capacity to hold it. Put an end to it. Never stop increasing your capacity if you're going to occupy. Did you get anything out of this today? The older you get, the better you should get. Gather all those years of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, experience, relationship building. And invest it in the here and now. These should be your best years of your life. Every succeeding decade should get better and better and better and better. And stop wallowing in self-pity, wishing that you could have done it differently. What you did, what you experienced, made you who you are today. Now take who you are today, invest it in tomorrow, invest it in the future. Occupy like Jesus said. Hallelujah! That men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Give them something to glorify. Ah, come on, let's all stand. How tall can a tree grow? I got to get us all on the same page. How tall can a tree grow? As tall as it can. In other words, you don't know. You don't know how far you could go in life. You won't know until the day you die and look back from heaven and say, well, that was pretty far. You just keep growing. You just keep growing. You just keep growing. And as you get older, you pace yourself. You pace yourself. You know why? Because as you get older and sharper, all right, a sharp axe takes less effort than a dull axe. Am I in the book? Is that Proverbs? As you get older, you get sharper, so it takes less effort on your part. That's why those who are good at what they do make it look easy. Can I tell you, I sat there and watched Michael Jordan. And I, I could do that. <laughs> Make it look easy. That's over time. Process. 
growth, experience, and learning, and wisdom, and you get better and better and better at it. I'm a better parent now than when I was raising my kids. Ask my grandchildren, they'll tell you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a nation that takes a day to acknowledge the importance of mothers in our world, in our families, in our communities, in our lives. What an incredible idea, mother. Respected by you, established by you, anointed by you to play that critical role in the development of humanity. Thank you as today we honor our mothers. Thank you as today we honor your word and your admonition to occupy, to bring all that we are to the table so that you might give thanks for it, bless it, and then use it to feed 5,000. Rebuke us for ever diminishing what we have. Because even the man with one talent started out with the opportunity. He failed in the process. Let us not fail in the process. Bless us and anoint us. There's a season ahead of us that's exciting, that's filled with opportunity, filled with your presence, filled with open doors. Heighten our awareness. Increase our faith. Let us look at a mustard seed differently and know that the potential is what's inside of it. And so it is with our lives. We thank you and we're excited about the future because we're in it and you're in it with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, slap high five with three people. Tell them I got that word. Enjoy your Mother's Day celebrations. We love and appreciate you and thank you. But we can't close this without giving opportunity for someone who may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our minister Reggie is back to drop the mic again <laughs> and to lead you and then close out the service. I love you. God bless you, family. Amen. Now, if you're visiting for the very first time, can I see your hands? Just lift your hands so I can see you. Your mother may have invited you, or you could be a mom that was invited. But I have to say this. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, how vitally important that is. Pastor said that there's two, two parts to the gospel. The, the gospel is both salvic and social. It is first about your personal transformation. And many of us, we fight coming to the Lord because there's a risk involved. Some of us think that there's some things that won't change or there's, there's some things that we're, we're scared to walk away from. But God is saying, I need you to leave everything to come to me because in me is everything you need. In me is everything that you need. So if I'm talking to you and you've never confessed the Lord as your personal savior, I'm going to ask you once again to raise your hand so I can see who you are and I can lead you into prayer right now. And don't be afraid. Amen. I see that beautiful hand. Amen. Amen. And family, I'm going to ask you to help in repeating this prayer. It's very simple. Say, Father God, here I am. Everything I am. Everything I'm not. I give it to you. I thank you that you have given me gifts. You've given me everything I need. And so I'm giving it back to you. I'm going to occupy everything you've given to me. 
I'm going to sow it in this earth and reap the reward because the scripture tells me that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Today, I seek you, God. I give you everything. I am yours. Everything about me is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. It's just that simple. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. Amen. Family, God bless you. Mothers, we, we want to say to you again, Happy Mother's Day. I know that the restaurants will be packed, so let us get out of here so you can get your... <laughs> Amen. Let us say something good as we leave this place. Never God's presence. Jesus is Lord. And we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. And welcome to the kingdom of God. Amen.